Don McMinn, our Minister of Music, and I want to welcome you to our uh, third, really our third performance of our Christmas concert. This one is unique in that we include those of you online, and we welcome you in whatever may be your setting, in whatever country you find yourself. We're so glad you're here. And if you're a guest of ours today, a special welcome to you. And uh, thank you, Don, for the hours you have put into this. I'm tempted to ask you to name all the conductors, but that would catch you maybe <laughs> off guard. There's a number of you, five of you. And uh, I think it'd be a great time to thank Don, the five conductors, and our orchestra, and our choir. Thank you. Well, they're singing our songs out there, and now that it's Christmas, it's time that we sing them in here. You'll hear some familiar and some unfamiliar pieces. Enjoy them all, and remember it is about our Savior who was born to become the Lord our God. Pause with me as we pray together, will you please? Thank you, Father, for what brings us together for the, the beauty of the season, the magnificence of great music, for the discipline of fine musicians, vocal and instrumental alike, for the faithfulness as they practice hour after hour for a moment like this, for these who have come longing for their hearts to be lifted Remove the burden from our minds today as you replace that with the joy of our Savior. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. And we together rejoice in the name of Christ our Lord, committing this wonderful concert to you. For Jesus' sake, we pray these things. Everyone said, Amen. Enjoy the concert. not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. 1 Corinthians 13 verses 4 and 5. Christmas can present a whole new set of reasons to be envious. Perhaps this time of year brings into sharp focus the families at church who are better off than yours or the friend's husband who buys more thoughtful gifts than yours does, or the colleagues who can afford yet another skiing holiday over the new year. The basic meaning of the Greek verb to love was to be happy with your lot. Jesus is the great example, isn't he? No trace of jealousy in him.
Our next song is titled, Do You Know What I Know? And I think it would benefit from you knowing a little bit of the background of the song. In the early 1960s, there was a couple living in New York City, and they were musicians. He was a composer, and his wife wrote lyrics. And uh, they would get commissioned work uh, periodically, so a big organization commissioned them to write a new song. And they didn't say it had to be a Christmas song. They didn't give any theme or dictate any direction. They just said, we want you to, to write a song. Now, the, the specific date was 1962. Our nation was at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, later, historians would tell us that we came really, really close to having nuclear war with the Soviet Union during those days. So those of you who lived uh, in that age, I, I was 10 years old, we can remember fallout shelters, and we can remember being taught how to crawl underneath a school desk in case there's an atomic bomb that goes off. So there was a lot of fear and trepidation in our nation. Well, one day this couple were taking their stroll through Central Park, and they stopped to watch a group of young children playing. Children had, ha, had no recollection of or, 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 or no anticipation of what might be happening uh, war-wise, so they were just playing as children normally do. And uh, this couple studied them for a while, and then they said, we want to write a song for children, and we want it to be a message of hope, comfort, and encouragement. So they sat down on a park bench right there in Central Park, and they wrote the lyrics and the music to, to the song that we're about to sing. They borrowed uh, a part of the story from uh, the Gospel of Matthew. You will remember in, in that Gospel, uh, there is the telling of the story about how the news of the birth of Christ gradually spread all into the community. Uh, first, the angels announced it to the shepherds. And then the shepherds announced it to others, and it was a progressive realization that, that, that Christ had been born. Now, this couple uh, took uh, a little bit of liberty, a little bit of artistic liberty, in that they, they're, they're imagining the, the night sky telling the story to a little lamb. So the night sky says to the little lamb, do you see what I see? I see a star, a bright star. It's the star of Bethlehem. Then the little lamb shared with a shepherd boy, asking the question, do you hear what I hear? I, I hear a song. It sounds like angels resonating in the air. The little shepherd boy then uh, spoke to a mighty king. He asked this question, king, do you know what I know? <laughs> Somewhere in the night there is a baby and he's shivering. We should bring him silver and gold. Well, then the mighty king proclaimed to, to people everywhere, listen to what I have to say. He said two things. First was peace on earth among all people. Pray for peace among all people. Wasn't that a, a reassuring message to hear back in 1962? Pray for peace, people everywhere. And then he said this. He said, yes, there is a child who's been born He's now sleeping in a manger somewhere. He will bring us goodness and light. He will bring us good, goodness and light. Uh, David Gashin, thank you for singing the choir. And Alan Hightower, thank you for directing. Uh, do you know what I know?
A star, a star, dancing in the night with a tail as big as a kite. With a tail as big as a kite. Said the little lamb to the shepherd boy, Do you hear what I hear? Ringing through the sky, shepherd boy. Do you hear what I hear? A song, a song, a high above the tree, with a voice as big as the sea, with a voice as big as the sea. Just bring him silver and gold. Send the king to the people everywhere. Listen to what I say. Pray for peace. 
beautiful singing. Would you all stand, please? And now it's your time to sing two great Christmas carols.
stepping through this sacred sky, suddenly our eyes behold heaven's perfect plan unfold, Son of God, Son of God, love divine, timeless one steps into time, who could dream When Christmas comes, three words say it all. Love came down. Love came down. 
the one who personified love came to be with us. The one who uh, exemplified humility lived among us. And the one who modeled sacrifice and obedience died for us. Those three statements bring to our minds three questions. If he came down to us, what did he leave when he came down? And if he moved in with us, what did he take on that was not true before? And as he walked among us, what was he like? We have John to thank in answering the first question. John, the beloved disciple, perhaps the one closest to Jesus' heart during the years that he discipled those 12. Three other men wrote their narratives early on, but John waited get this, 60 years before he put his stylus to the manuscript and wrote of what he remembered and what he felt was significant as he put together his gospel of belief. He starts earlier than any other writer of Scripture. He begins, in the beginning was the word. By the way, John seems to have sort of a nickname for Jesus by then. He calls him Halagos, the word. And so he goes all the way back into eternity past as he describes the one who was with God. In fact, the one who is deity. He made all things, and apart from him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness could not extinguish it. But that was true when he was in eternity past. And it's so important at Christmas time that you not think of all of it beginning in Bethlehem's manger, for that's when his earthly life began. But he has always existed. The way John writes that in the early part of his gospel, in a beginning which really never had a beginning, eternally existed Halagos. And while there he was the creator, while there he was the life giver, he was the light provider. But then John adds, by the 14th verse of that first chapter, the, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. I've always liked the way Eugene Peterson renders that. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. He came to live as one of us. He took on flesh. So that was the difference when he came to earth. Before, there was no flesh, but upon the decision to arrive here, well, to become a human being, he must be born. I mean, he didn't arrive as a, as a five foot, 10 and a half, 11 inch Middle Eastern adult. He began like we began in a womb. Not just any womb, but the womb of a virgin. Why is that important? Well, his sinlessness must be preserved. 
Don't let anyone ever tell you that the virgin birth is not that significant. Without the virgin birth, we have a sinful Savior. You see, when, when Mary and Joseph first looked into the face of their baby, they saw for the first time on this earth, in flesh, the face of God. And when they heard his cries, they heard for the first time on earth the sound of God from a human throat. Just amazing. What humility that he would be willing to give up all that he had in the resplendent magnificence of heaven in eternity past and be willing to, to limit his his life to an earthly life. So he took on flesh. Paul writes of this as he describes the humility of the Savior. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, that's eternity past, did not regard his status as God is something to cling to, but he emptied himself. Of what? When he came to earth, what did he empty himself of? Get this, the independent, voluntary use of his divine attributes. You see, before he was a human being, he was totally independent. Needed no one relied on no one, but, but when he became a human being, he was deity in diapers. He must now learn what we had to learn. He had to learn to control his bladder and his bowels. He had to learn how to talk, how to walk, how to write, how to count. If, if you were to cut his finger, he would bleed. If you were to strike him, he would bruise. You see, he is true humanity at the same time undiminished deity. Theologians call him the theanthropic person. Theos, God. Anthropos, man. Two natures unmixed in one person from his conception on to this moment. His conception. He, the mighty God, who had made all things, the rippling streams, the rivers, the hills, the majestic mountains, the marvelous plains and the arid deserts, he came to his own things, and his own ones didn't, didn't receive him, didn't welcome him. Why? Well, he didn't look like he was heaven sent. I, I, I mean, he didn't have a halo. He didn't glow. He wasn't 12 feet tall. He didn't have wings. He looked like any other Middle Eastern adult. When he grew up, his enemies called him uh, the, the carpenter's son. When in fact, the carpenter had nothing to do with Jesus' conception. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit in the virgin's womb. And so when he came and, and lived among us, it was just like we are, except he knew no sin, did no sin, and, and, and had no sin. Oh, and unlike us, he came to die. We come to live. And he never lost sight of that mission. He who knew no sin was made sin on our behalf that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 
How magnificent. What a transfer. The life that he lived qualified him for the death that he died. And the death that he died qualifies us for the life that he lived. I don't know that anyone has ever done better than a, a British pastor who was born in 1864 and died in 1928, Dr. James Allen Francis. You may have never heard of him. He ministered for years and often to young people because of his ability to break down theological truths into shoe leather, everyday language. And he wrote a piece that to this day is unsurpassed. Every Christmas, I remember and remind you of Dr. Francis' words. Here is a man who was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another obscure village, worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30, and then for three years he was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never owned a home, never had a family, <laughs> never went to college. He never did one of the things that usually accompanies greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He had nothing to do with this world except the divine nature of his manhood. While still a young man, the tide of public opinion opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. Another betrayed him. He was turned over to his enemies. He went through the mockery of a trial. Not, not just one, but six, all illegal. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. His executioners gambled for the only piece of property he had on earth while he was dying, and that was his coat. When he was dead, he was taken down and laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Nineteen wide centuries have come and gone, and today he is the centerpiece of the human race. He is the leader of the column of progress. I'm far within the mark when I say that all the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of mankind on this earth as powerfully as has that one solitary life. Most of us in this room have had our lives transformed by that one. Most of you who are viewing online could say, he's my savior. This is the season of the year when I celebrate not just a baby in the manger, but the Son of God who became the Son of Man. And my Lord. Paul says that God gave him a name that is above every name, but at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Say those three words with me Jesus is Lord. Once again, Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But he may not be your Lord. You may open gifts at Christmas. You may decorate your tree and pretty up your house and enjoy the songs of Christmas. But unless you miss it, you're going to leave a gift unwrapped or wrapped under the tree. And, and, and you're going to go on with your life and you're going to miss the whole purpose of it. For God so loved the world that he gave you, his gift. He gave up his son that 
we might have his son. And when you unwrap the gift by faith, he becomes your Savior. And as you grow in him, he becomes your Lord to guide your steps, to fill the empty spaces of your life, to forgive your sins, and to bring you home to be with him. Don't miss that gift this Christmas. Bow with me, will you? On this day, Lord, we thank you for that holy night when the stars were brightly shining the night of our dear Savior's birth. Thank you for giving him so graciously to us. Thank you for providing with him life abundant, life filled with grace and mercy and peace and hope and forgiveness in an eternal home. Our hearts go out to any who may not know your son. Bring them to yourself this Christmas, I pray. In his name and for his sake, everyone said, Amen.
thank you for joining us this morning. If you're looking for hope and belonging, we invite you to connect with our church family. Get started today at stonebriar.org. We'll see you soon.